My role is that I'm a professor and chair in health psychology at Deakin University and Deakin University kindly allows me to also work as the chief executive officer of uh, Communities That Care Limited, which is a not-for-profit company that sits under the Royal Children's Hospital. Communities That Care was uh, a process that began in the United States. Its uh, introduction to Australia is now over a decade old and a group of us saw that it was a very good process but we realised it was bigger than just running it as a program. It needed to be a company that employed a number of people to do the work. What it does is it tries to provide capacity building to help uh, local communities to better understand how they can use effective prevention in order to change outcomes for the better for children and young people under uh, it, their community. The purpose of Communities That Care is really to make the world a better place for children and young people. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We want the next generation to more fully realise their potential than previous generations did. In order to do that, the environment that children grow up in has to be a place where we get rid of some of the things that are actually holding children back. So we, we, talk, we talk about those as risk factors and that word is very much deliberately using the language that we know from heart health programs where we're aware of risk factors that can reduce heart health such as cholesterol and also trying to improve uh, protective factors. And again, we know that if we're physically active, that's going to be better for our heart. So, so too with children's development that there are protective factors such as having loving relationships that can really lead them to have a much better outcome. We talk about prevention very much as being something where if we were to look at the journey a young person's going to take through their life, we know that if we can change experiences they have early on, that we're going to prevent some of the big social problems that we've currently got. So the big ticket ones that could be reduced are mental health problems, crime and the need to incarcerate people, alcohol and drug problems, relationship breakdowns and violence. All of these things have a pathway and there's a reason why people are behaving like this in our society. And what we're saying is we now know a lot about children's development. That science has grown enormously, but the community needs to be able to actually know what to do and to change the things to prevent these outcomes that are actually preventable. So Communities That Care basically tries to simplify what a community needs to do and it uses a five-phase five phase model. So really those five, five phases are pretty familiar to people who've been involved with any public health endeavour at a community level. So firstly what you're trying to do is find out if there are people in the community who want to prevent the problem that you have in mind. So if we think about it with tobacco prevention, we know if we were to think 10 years back that it would have been hard to find in some communities there would have been a number of people who would have been reasonably keen on reducing tobacco but they probably weren't keen on plain packaging. Then there was a lot of work done to try and educate us about the need for that. Uh, then what happens next is a group of champions get together and they form a board. So in order to have plain packaging there needed to be a coalition of people that talk to government in order to bring that in. So similarly in a community, if you want to reduce youth using alcohol, you need to bring together the champions, the group of people that can make a difference on that issue in your community. And we call that a Communities That Care Board at Phase 2. Phase 3 then, what you're doing is taking the public health approach and you're mapping the information that you're going to need. So if we were to go back to plain packaging, they needed to find out what were public attitudes, what sort of reaction were they going to get from the industry, uh, what did government think? So similarly at a local community level if you want to deal with alcohol you've got to think about what do local people think, what sort of reaction is it going to be to us trying to bring evidence-based practice in. You also want to know what are the young people doing, where do they get their alcohol, what's their use of it currently, what's their attitude to it. So all those things are part of phase three where we develop a profile of the community, set targets for the things we want to reduce and the influences that we want to attack. Phase four is then setting up a plan. So basically this is where we try to harness resources into an evidence-based plan. Uh, and so we need to deal with all of the sources of supply of alcohol, if alcohol is the issue. We need to look at changing attitudes. We need to make sure that um, everybody is doing things and practice as much as possible that are gonna make a difference. So community care is very much about changing the social environment. So we try and look at uh, educational programs, parents, 
as part of the, uh, they need to be part of the partnership and also making sure that retailers understand their responsibilities not to sell alcohol and supply it. So you're really trying to deal with all the levels that occur in the community. Phase five is, again, we're very serious in uh, this particular program about making sure that we get to where we said we would go. So there's further evaluation and monitoring as we move forward with a plan in communities that care. And there's a piece of information that comes from surveying young people, which is a key piece of information, and that is repeated uh, through the process at the end at phase five and also at phase three. So you know where you want to go in phase three and then you know you got there in phase five. The Community Care uh, Program uses readiness theory, which is actually now quite a developed body of data in the uh, community development movement. And it's uh, community readiness theory holds the view that there's something you can do at every level of readiness as your community is moving forward to deal with an issue. When we talk about readiness, people are often uh, uh, glaze over and don't know what we mean by readiness. But if you think about it, you can think of readiness for behaviour change. And we know some people who wish to quit smoking can be at a stage where they're uh, smoking at the moment. They're not even, they might be thinking about doing it and we call them contemplators. Other people have actually made a few attempts and they're taking action, they might be relapsing. And there's other people that are not even thinking about it and they're pre-contemplators, they're not ready to take any action. So too, the same can be applied at a community level and we can think about readiness in the same way. So if we think about preventing the problem of youth using alcohol, we can see some communities are not even thinking about that as an issue. And if we were to go there, they'd tell us uh, that they think there are other higher priorities that need to be dealt with and they don't see that as a big issue. And uh, so that does happen a lot. Uh, other communities, we see that there are champions in the community that are actually very concerned. And they might have read information that shows that by drinking at a young age, you're actually increasing the likelihood that you'll drink heavily through your life because your brain is very sensitive to alcohol at a young age and you're going to develop dose tolerance very quickly by drinking even small amounts. So they've read that information and they can be champions or they may have seen in another community what's possible. So then we bring them together in that uh, where there's a low level of readiness and they're likely to um, face uh, other people that are in conflict with that view and we teach them how to actually communicate the evidence and talk to other people to bring them on board so more people can become actively champions for this. When enough people are then you've reached a higher level of readiness and, an, and a community can have reached a stage where it's ready to organise formally to address the issue. At that stage you still need data and there's a lot more to increase readiness. A community gets to a higher level of readiness in our view as it moves through the phases of communities that care. So communities that care is built to map readiness and to build readiness. At a high level of readiness a community actually has been through a few cycles of data collection. It's already got people on board formally putting money in to try and reduce the problem and it's well organised to take action when it sees it, either it is getting there or it's not to uh, alter the action it's taking. And so it's really taken charge at that stage. At a high level of readiness, a community is um, very well prepared to take action on a whole range of issues it faces. In order to get ready so that a community is making a start and it can do a community care program, we invite the, the thinking that a lot of the stakeholders need to be there. Initially, they won't all come to the table. It's just not realistic uh, to think that everybody is going to be a champion early on. So we have the view that start with who is a champion, and, and, but have in mind that eventually you'd like to have the widest a variety of stakeholders but you shouldn't not take action because everybody isn't at the table. So our view is you begin with those that are willing and uh, what we have found is that the process can build more interest amongst people as it moves forward. So who should be there ultimately are those people that are in a position that uh, they could benefit from a prevention change. So if we think about the issue of youth alcohol use, what is not immediately aware to many of the funders of the large programs that uh, they invest in in our region is that alcohol actually is having uh, an effect and it's one of the reasons they're having to invest large amounts of money is because these, or, these issues are there. Uh, it's a preventable issue to actually reduce young people using alcohol and it would save money in a whole range of budgets. It would save money in the hospital budgets that are spent here. It's going to sa save you money in uh, other um, 
costs to do with social problems. You're going to have less domestic violence. You're going to have less road trauma. Uh, also, it's going to save money on much of your welfare spending because we know that if you can reduce youth drinking, you will have a measurable increase in the number who complete school and they won't need to be dependent on welfare. They're going to be uh, contributing to the tax base. So they're huge advantages economically, but they're not clear at the moment. Uh, the pathway to achieving those is, has not been um, mapped closely enough. So we think all of those people who could benefit at that level, we call them key leaders, need to be at the table learning about the approach and you need to think about them as you're planning a communities that care approach. You also need youth to be involved, local agencies. We want it to be a coalition that's uh, active, uh, that really is inclusive. We want the indigenous population to see that, they, that, that they're involved and that their needs are being met. We, we want to make sure that all aspects of diversity are covered in these coalitions. But ultimately, you, you do have to be thinking the big picture and you have to be communicating the advantage of a preventive approach to all those levels that are going to benefit ultimately as you can make a change. With Communities That Care, the governance we, is handled in what we describe as a Communities That Care board. Now the board, it doesn't have to be formally labelled as a, either a board, it can be called a, a coalition. There's other labels that people use it and we, we not, don't really care too much for how it's presented. And also, we, we're not uh, proprietal about Communities That Care being the name that the board gives itself. So many communities name themselves in a way that identifies with their community. And we, we, we think that's very good because it's a good community development step. We do want them to, uh, if they're going to use the process, to use the process and agree to use the process with high fidelity. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of evidence that if you do the steps um, and you uh, carry out the survey, for example, with high um, competence, then people will look at the data and they'll trust the data to a greater extent. And the plan is one we want uh, governments to actually feel confident to invest in, so we want it to be done to a high standard. So those things are what a board is uh, needing to do then. They need to be skilled at doing that. So we th therefore need to make sure that the board has got good training in the prevention science approach, that uh, the board knows when th what they're getting into, that they're signing on to do this to a high standard, and that they'll stand by the product in the end. So what that means is the board has certain disciplines and uh, the way that the board is organised, so the governance need to be such that um, you've got a way by which people can make decisions, uh, that they can form working groups. It doesn't need to be um, a special form of governance. We don't recommend one form of governance, but it does need to be one whereby there's openness in the way that the meetings are conducted. So we would think that uh, a lot of that should be handled as good practice in the way that an organisation, a community organisation functions. It's obviously going to be an organisation that invites membership from a range of different perspectives. There will be some disagreement and conflict along the road, that's to be expected. And so all of those things need to be part of the way governance is handled. All things being equal, we know that we need to keep minutes and records of what we're doing. Decisions need to be um, uh, formally announced and there will be a lot of public face with the way that governance occurred so people are accountable in the community. As the board moves forward to phase three, they'll publish a community profile report and that report will actually state that these are the main priorities to be addressed for youth in our community and we look for that to become a consensus document. So the way the board behaves needs to be one that builds confidence in the community that when that, uh, that call for consensus is made that, that the uh, issues of any conflict that might be there have actually been handled in such a way that was respectful and enabled those differences to be recorded in the way that the statement, the call is made for a consensus. So I don't think that's um, that different and unfamiliar to us with other community processes we go through. Of course, when the, the final plan is also put together in phase four, then again, there, there'll need to be confidence uh, on the part of key leaders in the community that they're prepared to put money on the table to enable that to roll out in a large way. So there'll be a lot of consultation. So the board does need to behave itself in such a way that uh, it can invite this type of collaboration. As, to, as it also is the case in phase five, the board will be accountable for the results that are going to be published as to how well we went in this community in achieving the objectives of improving the, the community from the perspective of young people. So again, at that stage, the board needs to be prepared to 
um, be, I suppose, brave enough to face an evaluation and also to, to know uh, what to do if it's not a good uh, story. Because it, it, it's not always that you, when you evaluate yourself, you get a, a result that's showing that you've, you've got it all right. But again, communities that care as a company would be there to stand by the, the process that's taken. And uh, we try to make sure that boards are well prepared for each scenario that might emerge. Mostly our results have been very positive, but we've also had to work with boards that have had to publish a finding that might show that they didn't get the result they were looking for in the first uh, effort. But often there will be indications of what to do next as in any evidence-based approach. The good news is that the evidence will tell you what to do and what uh, will indicate pretty strongly what you can do in order to get a good result ultimately. And so we think sometimes what the board has to say at that phase five where it might not have been everything they were looking for is really a story of let's stay the course. So again, perseverance is a very important part of governance in prevention. And uh, the one thing to say about that is we really need to go beyond the um, election cycles which have governed other forms of efforts from government. So here we try to be asking for a reasonable length of commitment from those that are involved with the governance of CDC. Communities of Care has its own youth survey that's been developed uh, and it was carefully developed by the originators of the program in the United States. We've actually taken that survey and adapted it for Australia through a very large research program that we undertook with the originators of the survey in the United States. Now obviously with youth research and uh, youth surveys, there's a lot of them around the world and we often think that it's quite a simple process to run a youth survey because it seems so familiar. Uh, actually, that's true, and there's, but there's been a massive investment in these surveys in the United States beyond what we could ever match in Australia. The, uh, the size of their economy just is obviously 20 times ours, and we shouldn't think that we have to um, redo everything that they've done. But what we did need to do is to make sure it applied in Australia. So the survey they've developed is really the culmination of a lot of wisdom from millions and billions of dollars of investment in research. What they've tried to do is to pick those items and scales that have shown very, the strongest reliability and validity in all of the prevention science investment that started in the US really in the 60s. And uh, so they've had four decades of work in trying to understand how to ask questions of youth which items are valid and reliable and which ones are meaningful in terms of predicting uh, later health and social problems and what to do to prevent them. So this is what the Communities of Care Youth Survey is. It's really trying to uh, put into just a, a classroom period of questions. So it's trying to be just short enough that a, a, a young person can practically answer it during a school lesson and also to ask only those questions that are going to be really very helpful in prevention planning, but also needs to be comprehensive and cover the full range of issues that need to be think, thought about in youth prevention. And it also needs to take into account all the social environmental factors that are really uh, could be modified or need to be taken into account. When we did our work in Australia, comparing our uh, responses that we were getting to the United States youth, we included a 10 year follow up which was a full state sample in Victoria compared to a full state sample in Washington State. It was a massive study with 6,000 youth in it. And what we found is that the, um, the picture of young people developing that we got was uh, almost identical in the two states. The view that there's cultural differences in the effect of family conflict or in the way that family management affects your alcohol use we were able to show that is not true, that there are differences in the levels of risk factors between the two countries. But as a young person, family conflict is equally as bad for you in both countries. What that means is that we can be confident with that billions of dollars of research investment that occurred in the US that enabled issues such as family conflict to start to be addressed through evaluation of programs. And so we've been much more confident about picking up the solutions that they came up with and culturally adapting them for Australia. So what the youth survey does then, it provides us a link to a lot of the, I call it often, a, it's a really a, a, an indicator of which parts of the US prevention science um, investment to pick up on. Where we have high risk factors, but they have solutions, or they propose to have solutions, we should be looking more carefully at their solutions is the out, uh, outcome for me of all of this research into the youth survey. So the youth survey gives us an idea of both uh, how high the problems are in our community, 
So it measures things such as substance use, antisocial behaviour, depression is measured. And it, but it also measures uh, whether or not children are going well at school, so we get a good indication there of something that, again, that's very important to us. And then we get an idea of their social environments. It's asking questions about how things are going in their family. Again, uh, whether or not they're getting their recognition and opportunities at school. How are we going in the community? What's it like for them in the peer group? And again, looking very closely at their own behaviour. Look at things such as bullying, for example, which is a, an experience they might have in their peer group. So it's quite comprehensive. Uh, we've also included in the Australian version questions about diet and exercise. So these two things are new uh, developments that we also include in the Australian version. And again, they've proved very reliable measures of, of those behaviours, which are available then to be interrogated in each community. When we talk about a risk factor, again, what we're really going back to is to use the example of heart health, where we know that people are very familiar with talk of risk factors. In fact, the science of risk and protective factors was developed in the heart health area. So in the heart health area, if you ask people what are some of the risk factors that can damage your heart, people will talk about we shouldn't be smoking, we shouldn't be drinking too much, these things are going to be bad for our heart, it's not good to have high cholesterol. So those things are discovered because we know they have a causal influence on the outcome. So risk factors are not telling you the cause, they're indicating that there's a strong likelihood or probability that you'll have an increased chance of the bad outcome. And that's what the good thing about risk factors is, is giving you uh, the data and uh, a term to use about an increased likelihood or probability of the outcome. So how do we discover that you're someone who's likely to have the outcome that you want to prevent? So when we bring it back to young people, we need to talk about the things that affect them. So obviously what we're interested in is those young people who go on to have problems that were very visible to us as a community. At the moment we know that we would like to have fewer young people who have alcohol problems or drug problems. We'd like to see fewer of them involved in violence. We know that we don't want to see them dying on the roads and getting injured. Um, we're worried about their mental health. Family violence is another thing that we don't want to see um, obviously occurring. Early age pregnancies and uh, situations where um, mums are growing babies that are vulnerable. Again, these are very bad outcomes. Leaving school early is another one. So those can actually be dealt with in the same model and we can begin to find risk factors for those if we look at particularly longitudinal studies. So longitudinal studies have been done across the world, but we're very strong in them in Australia as well. And uh, one of the good things about uh, being in Australia is that people are really quite willing to share that information and they're very proud of the information they've collected. So for example, we have the Australian Temperament Project that began in 1983 in Australia. It's one of the longest running birth cohorts in the world. And that study has looked at a whole range of youth behaviours and uh, has information on parents' reports, the reports of infant nurses, and um, there's data now to the children being followed up in their 30s and we're looking at their children. So an incredibly rich source of data. That type of data, when you ask yourself, who are the children who went on to have problems with alcohol and other drugs? Uh, what were some of the things that occurred for them early on that might have been triggering points that led to that group? having those issues. That's how we identify risk factors in this type of terminology. And we find when we look at that, we can begin to see what some of those risk factors were. And it emerges that early age alcohol use or introduction to alcohol, the patterns of your parent drinking, and heavy drinking in adolescence is some of the things that we can see that are likely to predict your uh, moving on and having problems with alcohol as you're growing up as a young adult. So too with violence, similarly, you can predict or see the young people that went on to become violent when they were in their young adulthood. And again, we find there that there's a couple of different risk factors. One cluster of risk factors that can occur is where children are showing uh, these types of antisocial behaviours in childhood. And we often can trace those back to problems they're having in the very earliest relationship with their parents. Parents will be reporting difficulties with that child and also often the parent themselves, the discipline strategies they're using can be shown to be different to the community who don't go on to have those problems. Uh, there'll be um, escalating child behaviour problems that are not managed right through primary school and that 
that's a class of risk factors that we know therefore would need to be dealt with early on in life. And so risk factors can be identified through this really very important database of longitudinal studies, but overlaid on that we know a bit more about them from efforts to intervene. So we also study very much interventions that have been made that have shown that by reducing that risk factor that you can reduce the outcome. So we know there's a lot of information that parent education can reduce uh, child behaviour problems, both uh, the child behaviour problems can be measured by the children reporting their own behaviour or the parent reporting the child's behaviour and that th those things will lead to less violence as the children grow up and uh, reach adulthood. So that gives us even more confidence that the risk factor is having some sort of causal role there because if you can reduce it and then you are reducing the outcome, you're pretty clear that that risk factor is malleable and it was very much affecting the outcomes you're trying to prevent. So risk factors are, um, have different, uh, uh, can exist in different parts of a young person's life and they can come up at different times in development. They're studied through longitudinal studies and they're also, we add to our confidence in their causal relation through intervention work and by testing theories as well. So it's still area, I think they're still undiscovered territory, but what we do know that there's a very solid database for at least 35 of them and we try and measure all of those in the Communities That Care Youth Survey. So we have reliable measures of them that can be asked of children both in primary and secondary school. With protective factors, uh, what we're looking at there is um, something a little bit different to risk factor. And one way to think about that again is to think about the heart health example where we see that being physically active is going to be protective for your heart. And uh, the, it doesn't, with um, the uh, protective factors, the way we, they're measured in communities that care, we focus on those ones that really are going to make a difference in terms of particularly social development. So we're very interested in a theory of uh, development called the social development theory. The, uh, the, the idea of social development theory is that a lot of behaviours as you're growing up as a young person are influenced through your relationships and particularly who you're bond with or have social attachments to. So if you're very attached to a gang, then you will try to change your behaviour to fit in with the code of conduct in that gang. If it's a gang of bikies and they're violent, then you may have an initiation where you've got to show violence in order to join the group. So that is just one graphic example of what something that occurs right through our lives that we have inductions or bonding to certain groups. So obviously if it starts with our family, we want to, um, if we're bonded with our family, then they often have a huge influence on our, our behaviour. They'll also influence our beliefs and our attitudes to those behaviours. It also occurs at school that some people who have had uh, perhaps some difficulties uh, in their um, home, they can often develop a strong relationship with a teacher who cares for them and they will identify and wish to behave in that way. So a protective factor is called protective because it's very valuable for a person who has a high number of risk factors. If a person who, has, who enters, uh, is not doing that well at school, enters school with maybe having family difficulties, if they can meet an adult who offers them uh, this sense of an opportunity and recognises them, uh, helps them to develop skills, they can develop quite a strong relationship with that person and that can become a protective factor. So mentorship is quite protective of young people who are at risk. Uh, so to a teacher that takes interest in you and who breaks through and can find your way of learning, that can be something that people describe as having been a complete change for them in their life. Uh, they might have had a falling out with one parent, but the other parent they have a very strong bond with, so that can protect that child against bad outcomes. So protective factors are, are, are looked at in, the, in terms of having strong bonds or attachments in some, to a pro-social person or uh, institution in school, the community, it can be somebody that you've met in a sports club or it could be in your family. Uh, we also look at pro-social relations in your peer group and uh, these are protective factors that are measured. We look for rewards and your sense that it's a rewarding environment at school or at home, uh, in the community, and opportunities. So again, the idea that you do need an opportunity to join in a good club, 
if you have nothing else going for you, it's important that you still recognise that you do have that opportunity. And if that's rewarding and you can develop attachment there, then that could be a game changer in your life outcome. Protective factors also are things that you can have within yourself. So one thing is we measure in the Communities That Care Youth Survey social skills. So some people can have difficulties but uh, in school with their peer relations and they can get coaching about how to uh, approach peers and not uh, maybe be violent to them if they're uh, telling them something that's offending them. There's a way to be assertive about communicating that can be effective in reducing the problem. Uh, so social skills are very important and uh, also emotional skills are very important. So coping skills of how to deal with stress. Uh, we know that there's many counsellors teach children who have a vulnerability to depression about um, various mental health skills that they can use to cope with symptoms they might have. And so these things uh, give children a sense of emotional competence, the feeling that they can manage their emotions without necessarily those problems stopping them, doing the things they value and want to get on with in their life. So those things matter as well. Some people ha um, are just naturally uh, able to have a happy temperament and they can handle stress. That, that's harder to change. That is something that obviously is uh, a given. So some things are genetic and they protect you. Intelligence is another one. Some people have high intelligence and they can solve problems faster than others. And those things are quite protective if you've ended up in a situation where you do need to work out a different way of approaching things. But uh, we also do see that um, protective factors in social relationships can be built up. And so we focus particularly on those things, the skills and the protective factors, the areas that you could change. The way that we look at protective factors and risk factors in communities that care is we're very interested in looking at the environments that young people go up, grow up in. So we have the common language we use there is to talk about initially the family environment as the first environment that young people grow up in. So obviously in the family there's stages in the way the family works and it's going to be very influential in the earliest years but it continues to be quite important through the school years. As young people are growing up, they then are coming in contact with other parts of the environment. And school is the most obvious one, that the, as soon as they start to enter preschools or to get involved in primary schools, they're finding that parents suddenly are not the only big influence in their lives, that there's other people of those institutions that are going to have an effect on them. And so we uh, realise that we've got to have a clear measurement of the school environment and we have, need to be conscious of that as um, communities are planning what to do. As children into the school years, uh, with time, particularly as the primary school years move on, they're more and more in unsupervised time with other peers and so the peer group becomes more important as an influence on them. And so too as they're moving around in the community, the community is also having more and more of an impact. So that's adults in the community and the sort of values they hold and um, the norms, the laws that they have around selling tobacco to children. These are all going to affect the way children grow up. Obviously community also matters in terms of its overall organisation and that will affect parents. And so we know that community is going to be important also. It's hard for parents to do their job if the community are not providing a strong environment. So, for example, if the parents say, I don't want my child using alcohol, but if the community is, is making it freely available to them, then it's very hard for parents to do their job. So these things interrelate as well as have their own influence. And we, what we try and do through Communities That Care is to make it so that the influences can be very positive and powerful at each stage. With communities that care, it's a five-phase process, and at phase three, the community board are developing a profile of their community. The community profile is broken down really into two parts, and one part, what we're doing is really doing a community assessment report, which is looking at the environment in the community. A, a major piece of that would be the youth survey, communities that care youth survey, and that will be looking at uh, the levels of risk and protective factors and the types of behaviours at different ages that young people are involved with. 
It's not the only information that's, that's brought in when you're trying to do a proper assessment of your community. It should also be looking at other data. As much data as possible is often what I say. Uh, the other thing I say about doing the community profile report is realise everything is time limited. So many communities uh, will complain that they wish they'd had more time to dig deeper and deeper into issues. Um, my warning to people is that that can also be a trap and people are, uh, we do, we are information hungry, but they're, they're, it's also important to realise that we need to do an excellent job within a time limit. Don't go for perfection with anything, any stage of the process. So an excellent job is having improved data and enough data to be able to make a confident decision about something that matters. So are there, what sort of data can be brought in to assess our community? There's obviously census data. We should be consulting youth to try and get as much opinion as we can. Uh, we want to bring in the Australian Early Development Index uh, to, to look at what that's saying about our community. We want to look at census projections to know what future population of youth will live here. Um, is there likely to be some major development? that's going to affect the planning decisions that are made. We might want to look at existing rates of crime, uh, officially recorded statistics on mental illness if they're available from Headspace. All of these things are going to be very important. But more confirmatory, what we've really found is that the, the, the most important piece of information that will predict the future of what's going to happen next in your community is how youth see the picture. Often uh, we might not have a lot coming into um, police notice of offending, but if there, uh, we, we're seeing that there's actually heavy rates of illicit drug use going on underground, uh, that there's high rates of family conflict, that's a predictor that in the future that, that there will be a crime problem and uh, that we, we can pick that up before it happens using the youth survey. So all things being equal, we know from the vaster range of longitudinal data that parents sometimes miss things that young people are experiencing. The most important report is that of young people. The young people uh, report of their situation is the strongest predictor of their outcome later on. So the youth survey actually gives us really valuable information that we believe should be taken notice of. And uh, it's, it, it's interesting that it hasn't been available um, up until recent years that communities had a profile report of young people's survey data. There's been, it's good to have it and it's an important, I think increasingly government are re realising that that's an important piece of information that it, all communities should have. The second uh, thing that communities do is they, after they've made decisions about the important risk factors that they wish to address, is they do a, a, a community resources assessment. And with the resources assessment, what they're doing is they're going and finding the agencies that might be dealing with the risk factor. So if we take the example of family conflict, you, uh, your board would become very interested to know about the agencies that might already be playing a role to reduce that problem. So interviews will be held, try to get an idea of the number of youth that are covered already by that service, can it be expanded, what type of approaches are used. This type of information is collected then uh, to try and really drill down to what the opportunity might be to expand that service. Um, what are the struggles it has? All these questions are asked. The reason for narrowing down in the resource assessment to focus on the priority risk factors is because, again, it can be overwhelming to do community mapping that takes into account every service in town. But it should also be an open process that there may be services that are not um, well known that wish to make themselves known to the board. And so the community resource assessment also invites submissions and you have a process that sets a date to say, well, we're finishing the report on this date, submissions are open, and we're very much interested to hear from you if you have a submission to make about this issue. So an open process that, again, is fair and reasonable and practical is what we're looking for. And the, those two uh, pieces of key information that will include the student survey data, decisions that were made about the priority risk factors to address, and uh, what's already going in the community help the, uh, to develop the profile report which will also have a view as to where the gaps are at the moment and that leads to the next one which is the phase four activities. The social development strategy was a theory of human development that was developed by uh, professors Richard Catalano and David Hawkins, who are also very much the authors of Communities That Care. 
they uh, had the view that they needed to do a review of protective factors and the role that they play and to theorise how they work. So it's a theory of human development and how the role that protective factors play in um, predicting longitudinal research uh, uh, outcomes that could be modelled from previous studies into longitudinal human development, particularly looking at that period from childhood, uh, preschool period, then looking at the, the school age period, uh, the, the early and later school age periods, and then young adulthood. And so there's versions of the model, uh, the social development theory, that have been developed for each of those parts of human development. So what they really are is a, a synthesis of previous theories that have been put forward to argue how it is that uh, the major influences that are affecting child development. So they are um, bringing together a lot of theories that were developed particularly in the criminology area, but they also take account of behavioural theories that have been developed. So there, and attachment theory is also incorporated into it. The, the key ideas really are that um, we are influenced in our behaviours by our attitudes and beliefs, so we have an orientation towards uh, a, a behaviour before we engage in it. So we know that um, really young people are making up their mind about whether they're going to use alcohol and drugs, whether they're going to stay at school from well before that decision is made. And those things are very much in, in the attitude domain before they're affecting the decision and before they come out as an actual behaviour. So there's a staging and phasing of behaviour. We know from behavioural theory that you learn behaviours um, initially uh, from uh, and the behaviours you start in childhood, you continue to build on them. So uh, that can be in a positive or a negative. So if we go for the preventable, we know that often it'll be just learning how to sip a little bit of alcohol. That, uh, that, that behaviour has an effect on you in your development of your behaviour uh, domains that you tend to be able to then learn to do that. That's something that goes in your repertoire. You often want to develop more in an adult way with it, so you'll increase that as you get older. But also, behaviours have an effect at a neurological and biological level as well. So there's another level to the, th the theories of how behaviours develop. And what we really just focus on here is the young person's report of whether or not they're engaged in it. But what a lot of what I'm saying can also be explained in the neurological development of uh, your dose response to alcohol, for example. So these things are very related. They're all one science, the science of human development that we talk about. So with the social development theory, <clears throat> what is really being em um, emphasised there is social attachment as a key driver in the things that we take on board and develop an attitude to and that really reinforces behaviours that we're more likely to engage in. So social development uh, theory can be simplified into an account to basically say it's more likely that a young person will be involved in a behaviour if they're mixing with people who they have a strong bond with or attachment to that are involved in that behaviour. The, the, the likelihood of you having a bond with a person is influenced by the extent to which you have the opportunity to be involved with them and are rewarded or recognised for your involvement. And that can be either in a positive or negative way. So for example, um, if we use the example of being involved with a gang, a gang will often have uh, an induction ritual, and that can be sometimes quite painful, your involvement with a gang, but you won't forget that you're inducted, and then there's the sense of bonding and allegiance to that gang is not always through something. There is a, a recognition for your involvement, and it will often be the fact that uh, you've, you've become involved, you were given the opportunity, there was some form of ritual or reward or recognition that led you to then feel part of that group. More, more so, um, it's, it's an easier induction and it's through rewards. So praise is enormously important as a reward. Uh, just recognising that someone's doing something and being able to sort of mention that you'll see it is hugely rewarding and people don't get enough of it. And it really influences their sense of being part of you and, uh, and attached and, and uh, identifying with you. But skills matter a lot. So if we're going to be able to provide opportunities and we want to recognise people, we need to make sure that the young person has the skills to participate in that area. So it's all very well and good to invite a young person to come surfing with you, but if they end up getting horribly dumped in the first wave and they didn't have the skills, 
then it's not going to be a very re rewarding experience that you want to return to. So again, it's a matter of uh, what the social development theory is helping us to understand is the role that these things that we can change, skills, rewards, opportunities play in building healthy bonding. The five, five phases of communities that care have as phase four the development of a community action plan. And it's talked about in different ways. It can be thought of a prevention strategy plan. Uh, what it is, is it's going to be a document that's building on the work that the board has done at phase three, where the board has made the decision about the major risk factors and behaviours it wishes to change. And it also has a sense of where the gaps are from the work it's done in phase three. In phase four, uh, the action plan is actually setting targets for the delivery of services. So there's selection then of strategies that are going to be beefed up in the community. It could be that some of those might be existing organisations that are going to be assisted to expand. The community action plan is taking into account the number of young people that will be covered by programs. So it's really a numbers game and it's quite a hard-headed plan. You're going to be making plans for how much of a reduction you want to see over time in the risk factors you've targeted. So that goes to be looking at your phase three community youth survey and other data. We've actually been able to measure the number of children that have things such as high levels of family conflict. And you'll be setting a target to reduce that measurably. So if you've decided to reduce that, it might be that 33% of children have high levels of family conflict and you've made a decision to measurably reduce that, you might be deciding that in two years you want to see that come down to 25%, for example. And those decisions will be made partly on what the measurable change and an achievable change. So Communities That Care will help make decisions about those quantifiable changes that you, you're committing to as a board. If you're going to reduce something like family conflict, you then need to be confident that there's a program that would reduce the children's perception that they're growing up in family conflict. So Community Care provides a prevention strategies guide that maps to each of the risk factors and that the uh, prevention strategies that are presented there are all very strongly evaluated and they have a fidelity tools that can be used to ensure that they're delivered properly. And they're all designed to reduce the risk factors that are measured in the Communities That Care Youth Survey. <clears throat> so if the, if the decision is to choose strengthening families, for example, which is delivered to primary school populations, there's been many studies that give you a meta-analysis effect size of how much that will reduce family conflict. That's applied to the number of children that you think you can expose in your community to that program. And from that, you can get a metric of how much reduction there's likely to be in the population who get the intervention, and that's interesting. We really want to know, though, in the whole population, what will that contribute to reducing family conflict? So that, that puts the board in the position of realising that uh, we can't just select children who are going to be a small number who get a service, but we have to try and maximise the good work that we do to affect the whole population in our town. That's a harder ask, and it does require, again, a fair bit of discipline to think, what selections do we need to make to affect the largest change in the largest population? And that's the reason why Communities That Care encourages boards to think carefully in phase three about not aiming for too many risk factors to change, to try and be selective. Because it is actually a hard job for the board to cover a whole lot of children and there needs to be a lot of thinking about the strategies that will be selected. The good news is that Communities That Care can link you in with program developers that have had years of experience in achieving these changes and trainings then once as a board you've made a commitment to uh, select particular set of strategies. What you're really selecting is trainings from those developers as well. But you're also making a statement that if we invested heavily in these strategies in our community that it would also go to make a measurable change and we believe that is a measurable change in savings in the future. So we keep making that point that 
the plan will actually have an economic benefit for the nation. And we think all the benefiters are there in the state and the federal government need to be aware of the benefit you're creating. You'll have a, measured, a measurable way to demonstrate to them, and it needs to be that the report is used as an advocacy document, the uh, action plan is used as an advocacy document to try and get the key leaders to advocate for funding to come to your community. It's often asked, why can the action plan only include things that are in the strategies guide? And the answer to that is no, it can be broader. But what we do ask is that um, we're able to all have a conversation about the need for evaluation for things that people might be passionate about but have never been evaluated. So it's okay to include them, but there does need to be evaluation and a good evaluation of them. And for things that are clearly controversial, where we believe that the best of the prevention science is that they're not good, that there needs to be a conversation about removing them from uh, areas in the community where they might be um, being harmful for children. So part of Communities That Care is to actually have that conversation about what things are we doing at the moment that are actually maybe harming children. So one of the things that we're very keen on is that children are not supplied alcohol or that they can't purchase it. Sometimes there's some heartburn in that because we know that uh, people who are running businesses are part of our community. And we try and do that respectfully and bring all people together so that we're not inviting uh, unsustainable conflict. But we do want to have the conversation about what's in the best interests of kids. So too, sports clubs. We know that sports clubs are very good, but many of them have lax policies around alcohol and violence. And so, unfortunately, we measure that for many sports club involvement, the children are actually not going in a positive direction, but some of them can go backwards towards violence and, and substance use. So again, we're not in favour of that. We can measure that and it can be removed. So all things being equal, what happens is that the champions around the board in the action plan are identifying actions to move forward with, but they're also trying to take action to reduce things that might be bad influences as well. So it's a, it, it's a, an action plan is actually going to have a lot of effect if it's done well. It needs to be carefully thought through. It doesn't exclude anything that's innovative but we very much are trying to get everyone on the same page of evaluating. And it leads to phase five, where there will be a chance to test whether or not all of what was attempted through phase four did actually have the result that was planned.